Thank you and welcome back everybody. If you could just take to your seats as soon as possible so we can get started. Thank you. So our, our second session of the day is entitled Extremism and Counter-Extremism. It will be chaired by David Goodhart and if I could invite our first speaker, Mohamed Abdelaziz, who is a Nuhud scholar here at SOAS to speak first. Thank you. <laughs> Own, that's why. Bismillah. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, slightly misled by the um, program. The version that I saw um, suggested that um, I would come after Rizwan <coughs> and uh, Waqas and uh, Khadija. And I thought I could just add a few thoughts and uh, provide a few concluding thoughts on the impact of the legislation and non-legislative provisions made over the last 10, 15 years uh, in the area of uh, counterterrorism. But it appears that uh, I have to go first, so I'll need to provide uh, some uh, background. Um, and what I propose to do is to uh, present in three parts. <clears throat> the first part, looking at uh, some of the legal provisions over the 10 past 15 years, but particularly the provisions during the new labor years, um, mm -hmm. and particularly between 2000 and 2010. Say so a little bit about the non-legal provisions that were introduced by New Labour about the same time. And uh, finally, a little bit about what I feel are the chief uh, or the key impacts um, coming out of uh, both those legal provisions and non-legal provisions. So before I do that, I should make it clear that this is really coming out of one of the chapters for my PhD, which when I started in 2011-12, all of this stuff felt very contemporary, but the stuff that I'm covering is actually now almost historic, um, and I'm therefore very pleased that Wakas will be coming after me, because he'll bring us bang up to date. The first piece of legislation that I want to consider very, very quickly, um, well, actually, the first piece of legislation I'll spend a little bit, of, <coughs> little bit more time on than the other bits of legislation I might look at, and that is the Terrorism Act of 2000, which was the first and perhaps the most important of the legislation introduced by New Labour on terrorism. The main criticism of this legislation uh, is that it was dangerously broad and has affected vast numbers of people, in particular peaceful protesters, and ethnic minority and religious groups, particularly Muslims, where it need not have, um, and that it undermines civil liberties and fundamental human rights in a way <coughs> that has not been beneficial. The provision which is of most concern, I think, to most lawyers, um, concerned about this piece of legislation is the very wide definition that it gives to terrorism, which includes any action or threat of action which is designed to influence the government <coughs> or intimidate the public with the purpose of advancing a political, religious, or ideological cause involving serious violence against a person, causing serious damage to property, endangering life, creating a serious risk to the health or safety of the public, or acts designed to interfere with or seriously disrupt an electronic system. The definition is so wide, in fact, that it could cover almost anything, and it's been pointed out by numerous academics that it could even cover direct action or industrial action by doctors, nurses, or even the fire brigade. It makes no distinction as to which government the accused were seeking to influence, whether it's their own government, the government of a neighboring <coughs> democratic or friendly state, or the government or a repressive, of a repressive a colonialist state further afar. Nor is it specific as to where the act or actions took place. And whilst it gave some flesh to the scope of the acts to be covered, it was extremely thin on the threshold for those acts to begin constituting acts of terrorism. The second key concern with the legislation was the significantly enhanced powers of the police <clears throat> that the acts provided in relation to stop, search, and arrest. 
Section 40 to 43 of the Act defines a terrorist as someone who has been concerned in the commission, preparation, or instigation of an act of terrorism. The words concerned in and instigation are undefined and add to the vagueness of the wideness of the definition of terrorism in Section 1. The provisions in Section 42-43 collectively then allow the police to stop and search any person where they suspect a person to be a terrorist in order to see if they hold any evidence that proves the suspicion. The suspicion does not have to be justified and anything the police find during such a search and regard as evidence, the person may be a terrorist, may be seized and detained, uh, retained. Secondly, the provisions allow the police to arrest someone without a warrant, but simply on the suspicion of being a terrorist. And again, there is no requirement for the police to give grounds for the suspicion. And thirdly, <clears throat> they allow the police to apply for a warrant to search any premises for a suspected terrorist. And again, there is very little given in terms of what constitutes suspicion. <coughs> Considering the already very wide and indeterminate definition of terrorism, these police powers, all based on mere suspicion, are of course breathtaking, and equally breathtaking how open they are to abuse. But as if this was not enough, the legislation further provided in section 44 that the police were allowed to stop and search without suspicion in defined areas. And this disproportionately impacted particularly ethnic minorities and particularly Muslims. Fortunately, this has now been repealed. The other stop and search power is to be found in section, uh, Schedule 7 of the Act, <clears throat> which provides powers for constables, immigration officers, or custom officers at a port or border to stop, question, detain, and for the police to take the DNA of anyone entering or leaving the UK determine whether they are involved in some way in acts of terrorism. And again, the power can be exercised without any reasonable suspicion of involvement in terrorism. So these are two key provisions of that act. The third key provision of particular concern <coughs> is to do with prescription of terrorist organizations and related offenses. <coughs> Under Section 3 of the Act, the Secretary of State could prescribe an organization if he or she believed it to be concerned in terrorism. And again, the word concerned is not defined. Thus, academics have provided examples to illustrate the point as to how wide this could be. So, for example, where Greenpeace has been associated with tearing up GM crops, it could easily be prescribed as a terrorist organization. Further, an organization that encourages such actions without engaging in them itself could also be prescribed. And most vague of all, all organizations that is somehow concerned with terrorism, organizing some related anti-government rallies, for example, could also be prescribed. What's more concerning about this piece of legislation <coughs> is that the Home Secretary was not required to make a case against the organization in court to order the prescription <clears throat> and the organization did not get a chance to defend itself against the prescription. It could only appeal after the prescription had been made. So this is the 2000 Act. <clears throat> I'll go through the other main acts uh, more quickly. The second act <clears throat> of concern for us here is the Anti-Terrorism, Crime and Security Act of 2001. And this was formally introduced just a couple of months after <clears throat> and in response to the terrorist attacks in the USA. And there are two key provisions here, in addition to the 2000 Act. The first is the introduction of provisions on indefinite, and indefinite detention. Part four enabled the Home Secretary to indefinitely detain, without charge or trial, foreign nationals who are suspected of involvement in terrorism. However, soon after this legislation, about a couple of years later, the House of Lords, in a case called A and Others, 
found in favour of a terrorist suspect who had been <coughs> detained without charge for over two years and set a time limit for the release. And as a result, indefinite, action, indefinite detention was replaced later with control orders. And I'll come on to control orders in just a, a moment. But the other key provision of this mm -hmm. Terrorism Act of 2001 was the freezing of assets provision, which extended executive powers over freezing bank accounts and assets of suspected terrorists. Section one of the 2001 Act allows money to be seized and detained for a period of up to two years. Um, however, the magistrate's court can uh, order upon application for the cash to be forfeited uh, totally or in part. I mentioned that the indefinite detention provisions were repealed and this was replaced by control orders and this was in the Prevention of Terrorism Act of 2005. Um, and the control orders were basically a form of house arrest, uh, if you want to call it that or see it like that. It allowed the government to restrict the activities of individuals it suspected of involvement in terrorist-related activity, but for whom there was not sufficient evidence to charge. It resulted in unfair and unsafe orders imposing severe and intrusive prohibitions, including indefinite house arrest for up to 16 hours a day without charge, uh, let alone conviction. Five more minutes. How many? Five more minutes. Okay. Um, I'll just mention the other acts then and <coughs> what they introduced and say a little bit about um, the non-legal provisions before I move on to some of the conclusions that I want to test in my field work. Um, so the next act that was introduced was the Terrorism Act, which introduced the idea of pre-charge detention um, and also the idea of glorification of terrorism. And the final act that I want to touch on very, very quickly is the Counterterrorism Act of 2008, which provided for fingerprints and DNA samples from individuals who were subject to control orders. Very quickly, in terms of the non-legal provisions, um, and very quickly indeed, because I know Khadija will be covering some of these later on, um, there are really three sets of non-legal provisions that New Labour introduced. Um, the first was to do with community engagement <coughs> and leadership activities. Um, this started with the PET initiative uh, that Ifa talked about earlier. Um, Labour also, New Labour also supported this idea of setting up a mosque and imams national advisory board, MINAB, um, and also a Muslim women's advisory group and a young Muslims advisory group. It also invested uh, a fair bit of money in educational and awareness raising initiatives. And the two that, uh, that I'm looking at are the Radical Middle Way and Islam and Citizenship Education. And finally, it also put some money in to what was called theological initiatives, looking at contextualizing Islam in Britain and those two reports commissioned through Cambridge University it did some work around Muslim faith leadership training and also um, uh, working with theological institutions abroad like the University of Azhar. <coughs> Finally, uh, in terms of impact, I want to suggest that the, the three sets of impacts that came out of the decade uh, of work on counterterrorism from 2010 to, to uh, 2000, 2000 to 2010. The first set of impacts were to do in changes, to do with changes in the Muslim mindset. I want to suggest that after 9-11 and even after 7-7, there was considerable denial in Muslim communities that the bombings were the work of Muslims. Some suggested that it was a conspiracy to frame Muslims Many denied that there was a violent interpretation of Islam and that some authors of that interpretation lived among the Muslim communities in Britain. That outright denial seems to have dissipated considerably and Muslims are far more ready today to recognize that there is a problem that 
also needs Muslims to help address. There was a certain reluctance to condemn, this is after 9-11-7-7 perhaps as well, um, reluctance to condemn AQ outright. Whilst Muslim organizations disagreed with the atrocities, many Muslims sympathized with Muslim grievances across the world and the AQ cause. Towards the end of the decade, there was clearer condemnation of the AQ and a growing suggestion that AQ has caused serious damage to Muslim causes. One more minute, please. Okay. There was a tendency amongst Muslim organizations to couple the need to address Muslim grievances. And towards the end of the decade, there was a process of decoupling. Um, and there was a, a considerable degree of emphasis on the unity of Islam. And towards the end of the decade, there was at least some emphasis on the diversity within Islam within British Muslim communities. The second um, sets of, set of impact is that extremist voices and activities were driven underground. I recall very, in my, in my uh, youth, I recall people making open calls to jihad, both in terms of recruitment and financial support uh, for places like Afghanistan, Chechnya, Bosnia. Um, but even with me living in the Muslim community for all of my life now, and despite having the finger on the pulse, personally surprised by 7-7, well surprised by 7-7, subsequent atrocities, sudden rise of jihadis from UK going to Daesh or joining Daesh, young girls from Tar Hamlets going to Daesh or joining Daesh as jihadi brides, um, and families, mothers, taking their children uh, to Syria. Very finally, 30 seconds. Um, uh, despite the outreach and co-production work, <coughs> some of which I mentioned, by New Labour, um, my feeling is that by the end of the decade, Muslims, mainstream Muslims, are dispossessed uh, from the national fight against terrorism. And I'll just mention four very, very quick points on that. Um, two, perhaps. Uh, Make Sorry. it two. Make it two? Okay. Um, the ideological dogmatic position on the causes of terrorism um, and the single narrative or the conveyor belt theory um, meant that Muslims who would otherwise engage in this fight with some empathy for young Muslims could not <coughs> engage. If you want to hear the other three, ask me a question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the next speaker is Rashad Ali from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Rashad is a classically, tr classically trained in Islamic theology and interestingly has written both for Conservative Home and Dissent Magazine, uh, a magazine of the radical left in America. So a man of um, broad interests. Um, can I preemptively apologize for the superficiality of a discussion surrounding <coughs> extremism and counter-extremism within 15 minutes? Um, so that's, that's my first caveat. And the second one is I, I just flew back this morning and haven't slept, so I may be a little bit grumpy. <laughs> um, but to start, I thought, I, given the, the kind of context and the setting, and this is the Islamic Studies Department, um, I thought it'd be good to start from an intra-Islamic perspective on, on the discussion. You know, the whole notion of extremism within an Islamic framework is not <coughs> unheard of. Uh, whether it's going back to Quranic citations where we're told, La taglu fi dinikum, uh, do not go to excesses or extremities in your religion, or the warnings that the Prophet ﷺ gave, Iyakum al fi din, be wary of going to extremes in your religion. And various different traditions that existed on this, and the way Muslim scholarship traditionally has understood it. Um, so the, the concept of ghulu, of extremism, and how it was understood. Um, we, you know, by Muslim jurists in the past, we had a, a mention of Shatabi earlier, who wrote two very interesting works, one called the Atisam, which was about sticking to Islam, and the other was the Muwafaqat, which was about the purposes and the higher aims of the Sharia. And he discusses both these issues, he discusses the issue of extremism in both texts separately. 
And he speaks about a certain attitude in one. And that attitude of, uh, essentially is found in what he mentions as two examples. People who wish to stick to Eastern customs, believing those things are religious and dogmatic and holding on to them, and abandoning the urf, the custom of the prevalent society they're from. He mentions this as one of the examples of people being worried about clothing, being worried about attitude, and not really understanding that the social context that they're in is a factor. And the other thing he discusses in the Muafaqat, he says that those that are those that adopt merely the surface, what people call the literal, but he says the surface of the text, without investigating the undermining intent of the text, purposively understanding what it is that the religious scripture is seeking. And he says these are factors that create hulu and extremism. And the other prophetic tradition we have about this that's well known is halak al that they are destroyed those who are hair splitters, you know, obstinate. And Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the well-known famous jurists who's a contemporary of Shatabi, he says, this meant the mutashaddidun. And the mutashaddidun were those people that were so obstinate that they were right and everybody else was wrong. And they were obstinate about issues when there was no need to be obstinate about those issues. And so there's a lack of respect of diversity, a lack of respect of the plural tradition. And he said these were kind of factors that looked at creating uh, extremism in his mind, in those, in, the, in those scholars' minds. So within Islam, you have almost a, a tradition of looking at what is extreme or extremist tendencies. And they tended to be obstinate, rejection of diversity, attachment to alien tradition, irrelevant of context, <coughs> uh, and that type of mentality. And I think to some extent we can probably generalize from that to understand how that internally within Islam, how Muslims look at some of the debates and the discussions, and I'm sure the theologians amongst you can, can, can partake and maybe debate some of those issues. Bringing into a, a, an extremism and counter-extremism context in the legislation we have, I think there are obviously some similarities with the idea of defining extremism and defining British values. That actually I think some of those notions of pluralism, freedom, basic liberty, equality, democracy, the rule of law, as general ideas, people I think would generally agree with. And you have this debate and discussion, if you ask anyone what are British values, everyone will, won't know what you're talking about. And I think that's true. But if you ask people, do you think you should respect other people's right to free belief? People will generally agree. Do you think we should generally uphold the rule of law? People will generally agree. Do you generally think democracy is better than tin pot dictatorship? People will generally agree. And hence, those broad ideas of equality, liberty, tolerance, uh, the rule of law, and generally, yeah, you shouldn't support people killing our troops. I think most people in British society would agree with those things in their specificities, even if they wouldn't particularly define them as British values. The problem becomes in trying to legislate those things. Because then what you're trying to do is you're trying to pass law to dictate what everybody thinks, everybody believes, and not how people behave. Because legislation in broad terms is about drawing red lines. And we've seen some of the, the difficulties in the way the legislation has come out and the, the broadness and the blurriness of the red lines in Muhammad Abdelaziz's presentation. When you add this to try and now, what we are now having is a definition of extremism in, in the counter-extremism policy where we're trying to legislate for extremism is going to be infinitely, infinitely much worse than what we have seen. And I think this, for me, is a, is a major problem. For, the, for a number of reasons. First is, well, it's, it's kind of un-British. It's kind of self-contradictory. The idea that you can ensure freedom of belief by imposing upon people they have to believe certain things and can't express beliefs outside of that. Because fundamentally, that's, that's you know, the, whole, the whole thing about freedom of belief. People are free to believe what they want. It's in conflict with our historic traditions. You know, we have a history and a tradition that supports dissent. And I think this is the other part of the problem with this legislation. It is very 
very much partisan, small c conservative framing of the debate and the discussion is British values. Because actually British values are quite diverse and British history is very, very diverse. And the history of the left in Britain and its direct action and all of that is part of Britain and it's part of our history, it's part of our heritage. It's maybe not that neat and doesn't form a singular narrative, but actually it's part and parcel of it. And secondly, I think it goes, it, like I said, philosophically speaking, it conflicts with what we define as our value system. It conflicts with our philosophical heritage. That we have people who remember John Stuart Mill as someone who we look up to as an ideological intellectual, a philosopher, who did express part of the problem with inheriting liberty was that we would come to kind of not respect, not understand, and not appreciate the fact that liberty is priori to any particular right of belief or action or expression. And so actually protecting it is something that becomes fundamental. So I think in that sense, I think these are some of the issues and some of the problems with it. Having said that, we can kind of appreciate a social need to have some of these discussions, to define some of these issues. And yes, amongst academics and intellectuals, you can debate forever about defining terrorism. You know, the UN still hasn't decided on a definition. You can debate about what is extremism. And people will debate and discuss it forever. But actually, if I was to say to you, as a thought experiment, you have somebody who says very clearly, anybody that converts to Islam should be imprisoned or executed. I think we generally agree that's slightly off. Yeah? Anybody disagree? Again, in the... In the I think we generally agree that that idea that imposing upon someone a penalty or pain of death, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau did in the social contract, for someone <coughs> abandoning Christianity, today we would see that as an extreme point of view. And I think we can contextualize that and see that in British society that we would actually consider that a very extreme position to proselytize, to uphold, to believe, to enforce over society. So actually, even though we, we wouldn't necessarily want to legislate, I'm fundamentally against legislating it, I think it is quite simple to say there are certain ideas which we would see as extreme. And so as a society, we should be able to stand up and say, hold on a second, we stand against that. Similarly, although the framing of British values is fairly right-wing, a lot of the research that people have done, and including people on this panel, will show that actually one of the driving factors for extremism and radicalization, including in towards terrorism, is an absence of a sense of belonging. <coughs> and therefore, this is why in an integration context, we're talking about extremism because we see it as a fundamental barrier to extremism, and we see that, at least many people do, as part of one of the root causes by which people become radicalized and terrorism takes place, and hence there's a need for a discussion around belonging, and hence there's some context to the notion of British values, although actually we may see the notion of liberty, freedom, democracy, they're not particularly British. You know, the Greeks may lay somewhat of a claim to democracy. And so, on the other side of that, we can recognize the tension in the discussion that we want to look at countering extremism. We can't legislate against it. And actually, the measures in the counter-extremism policy are quite horrific. So the idea of banning groups for expressing these ideas is part of that strategy. It's still discussed, I think, in Section 5 of the counter-extremism policy. The idea of things which are similar to ASBOs, ASBOs in themselves, horrid, but similar to ASBOs for extremist preachers. Again, a means of curbing, curbing freedom of speech, something that is integral to our British values. The idea of removing citizenship from people. This is one of the suggestions in the counter-extremism policy. It's a horrific idea. Because not only is it, does it violate already extant legislation, that we've signed up to in the Human Rights Act, that actually we're not just going to remove citizenship from people who, and make them stateless. Unless 
you're talking about <coughs> defining the Islamic State as a state. You can't have it both ways. Either it is a state, and they've adopted it, and then we recognize it as a state. Or it's not a state, and we don't cut off the means of individuals from coming back if they wish to do so. Because that's effectively what you're doing as a policy measure, and as a legal measure, it's in conflict with, the, with all of the things we've already signed up to historically. Uh, three more minutes. Three I, more forgot, minutes. I forgot at the five minute point, I'm afraid. You, you were so engrossing. Okay. Um, so now, having said that, we do need to look at the context of this discussion because in the integration context, again, people will talk about this, again, in a very dichotomous way. People will describe this as an attack on Islam. And you'll hear people describing this as an attack on Islam and attack on Muslims. Well, actually, if that's the case, then you are saying inherently Islam is against all these values and Muslims all do not embrace these values. If, on the other hand, you're, you're going to criticize it and say, actually, no, hold on a second, these people are essentializing Islam and Muslims, well, no, actually, no. If that's the line that you're coming out with, you've essentialized Islam and you've essentialized Muslims as being inherently against those ideas which, as we've heard today from various speakers throughout the day, from Professor Abdel Halim, from um, Ifat Nawaz, etc., is just not correct or not true, at least in their perspective and their eyes. Now, that doesn't mean there are not unintended consequences, and therefore are there unintended consequences on the way the policy arrives, the way that the media discusses it, and the way that Muslims are perceived. Of course there are. And of course, that may well have led to a rise in anti-Muslim and anti-Islamic sentiment, etc. Both two very different and very distinct things. But we have to be very, very clear that actually we shouldn't be guilty of essentializing Islam and Muslims, which is quite ironic given where we are in the school of Oriental and African studies. I thought that was quite funny as a, <laughs> as a dig. Um, the last point I would add, and just to end, and I think just because, and I thought of this, and I know I'm probably running over, so I'll be very quick, um, just because it came up as a discussion point regarding citizenship and jizya and some of these discussions that we heard earlier. Actually, if you go all the way back to the founding fathers of Islamic jurisprudence and Islamic law, um, and I wanted to give this as an example, was Imam Malik radiallahu an. And Imam Malik, who had the view that actually, no, the Jews in Medina who lived in the prophetic city were not dhimmis. They were not protected citizens who had to pay the jizya. Explicitly they weren't. Because they were described by the Prophet ﷺ in the treaty they signed as Kana Ummatum Wahida, Baqi and Sa'irul Umam. They are one people separate from all of the nations. And you'll find Imam Nawi discusses that in his commentary on Shah Sahih Muslim. So actually the notion of citizenship belonging of togetherness, I think, is something very deeply rooted within Islamic teaching. Not necessarily all Muslims aspire to that, but that's the whole point. We are a diverse bunch, just like wider society, which has a very diverse bunch of political, you know, anarchists, leftists, right-wing people, Nigel Farage, <laughs> you know, and it's all part of being part of British society. And I think the only way we can combat the extremism on either sides of, or on all sides, is going to be recognizing the diversity, not trying to restrict it. Thank you very much. Thank you, mm -hmm. yep. um, thank you very much indeed. And um, next up, we've got Dr. Rizwan Sabir from currently the Department of Criminology at Liverpool John Moores University, but also an ex uh, SOAS man. Research assistant many years ago, yeah. only for a short stint, but I don't get cheered because it was less than, <coughs> six, less than six months. <coughs> Thank you for uh, the invite to the organizers. It's nice to see so many people here today. <coughs> I'm gonna crack straight on with it. Today I want to focus on how the government's counter extremism, uh, counter terrorism, strategy has essentially been operationalized and implemented when it comes down to uh, one organization, a rel relatively well-known organization uh, called the Quilliam Foundation. 
There's two points to this uh, paper today. One is to show you how the Quilliam Foundation has been manufactured by the government uh, to serve as a strategic asset against political Islam. That means violent and non-violent interpretations of Islam which say uh, Islam has an ability to govern uh, socially, economically, politically, and militarily. And the second one is to show or to frame the Quilliam Foundation's manufacturing by the state as a wider principle of counterinsurgency uh, warfare which is essentially what the theoretical um, uh, foundations of the counterterrorism policy uh, t um, are essentially based on. And Mohammed Abdul Aziz's uh, talk on the legislation, I think, set this up quite nicely because it showed that the state of exception that's been operationalized and implemented through that legislation and law. So the, the, the opponent, the political Islamic opponent, and I'm giving you a gross simplification of this, uh, is essentially considered to be uh, transnational and globalized. And what that essentially means is that this opponent is unified by a uniting <coughs> ideology that operates across the globe, but uses tactics and techniques that are relative to a particular environment. Now, um, historically, the, Europe uh, the European continent and the UK especially has been home to dissidents, including the infamous Karl Marx, and then later uh, Sheikh Omar Bakri Mohammed and uh, Abu Hamza, who's now serving uh, a sentence in an American prison, which is where the nickname came Londonistan, um, that famous uh, coin turned by French intelligence it was. And Londonistan has essentially uh, been claimed to serve three uh, purposes. One is to serve as a hub of intellectual, or intellectual and propagandistic capital, where places where political Islamic individuals and groups will organize and operate in, in this uh, kind of media savvy way. The second one is to raise funds, hence why a lot of the legislation implemented after 9-11 was about disrupting uh, economic systems and networks and so on and so forth. And thirdly, recruitment. So even though attacks have taken place uh, in Europe and the UK, 7-7 being the prime example, only a, a, a stone's throw away from here, um, what you essentially find historically is that the UK has served as a place for recruitment to violent militant actors across the world as opposed <coughs> to always being the target. <clears throat> so the argument is that if this is the threat that we face, how do you defeat this opponent? And military thinkers, uh, one of whom I've, I've referenced here is David Kilcullen, an Australian counterinsurgency theorist who served as General David Petraeus' uh, senior uh, task advisor um, and was responsible indeed for the surge that took place in Iraq in 2007, basically says that we, we, we need to imagine a chain. Political, political Islam being a chain, if you take out one of the chains, the chain collapses, or it weakens and it certainly collapses. So if we target those elements of this global movement, for example, by disrupting the, the media operations and uh, the organization and finance, then we weaken this opponent globally. So that is essentially the technique that has been used and encouraged in much of the counterterrorism uh, policy that's been implemented. And this is most vividly uh, visible, you could say, in the prevent strategy, because the prevent strategy builds upon this logic that the whole Islamic, political Islamic idea of violence is based upon a narrative. A narrative which says that the, that the Muslim world is at war with the West and the West is oppressing uh, Muslims and so on and so forth. So what we actually need to do is rather than address the socio-economic political factors which give rise to militant movements, we need to involve ourselves in countering ideology because that is ultimately the driving factor behind this. So it essentially whitewashes um, you know, decades of Western hegemonic control and domination of these populations and communities and basically offers an extremely simplistic idea that history started on 9-11 and these people are zealots that are driven essentially by uh, a set of ideas and if we challenge those ideas and grievances then we'll deal with this issue. This is where minimum <coughs> force comes in and the use of minimum force is a very important counterinsurgency principle. Now the slides are filled with information but counterinsurgency as a doctrine is based on four ideas, uh, exceptional but limited force. If I was to shoot everybody in this room because there was one terrorist hiding, the likelihood is that I'd breed 100 more terrorists. So you need to use limited but exceptional force and if you can, through the force of the law. Secondly, it's based on increasing your intelligence and surveillance infrastructure and capacity. And this is very important where the PREVENT program is concerned because we know now through empirical evidence that's been collected over the years since its implementation that the PREVENT program is essentially one that is uh, uh, one, 
one that is based on the collection of low-grade information collected through community <coughs> intelligence, neighborhood <coughs> policing, and crime prevention, and so on and so forth. The third one uh, is the integration of civilian and military power. This is best understood through the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015, which has just gone on to become law and has made the Prevent program into a, uh, essentially uh, given it legal standing and legal uh, strength. And the fourth one, which I want to focus on today, is called Influence in Military Doctrine, better known as Psychological Warfare, PSYOPs, or Hearts and Minds, as the saying goes. One of the agencies responsible for Hearts and Minds is a little unit in the Office for Security and Counterterrorism in Whitehall, uh, known as the Research Information Communication Unit. Now, I know some of you will know this, um, but essentially it was created in 2007, and it's coordinated by four agencies that are listed there. Foreign Office, Home Office, Communities and Local Government, and the Ministry of Defense. What one of its key research projects, which it allocated to an external agency to conduct, found, and this is a key quote, to undermine political Islam, messengers who were or who are, amongst <coughs> other things, passionate, charismatic, articulate, and quote, Islamic, are needed to counter political Islamic propaganda. And this logic ties into the fact that when you are trying to persuade somebody to change their ideas and their viewpoints, what you essentially need to do is you need to use a language that resonates with that person so you can appeal to their emotions. And that's one way of persuading them to either change their outlook on the world or to internalize a particular idea or viewpoint, and so on and so forth. And also, of course, this is a very famous uh, military uh, thinker, Frank Kitson, responsible for um, much of the counterterrorism and counterinsurgency activity in the north of Ireland during, quote, the Troubles. And he basically says, in this quote I read many years ago, and I find it extremely powerful, and I'll read it. It says, although the government may provide the framework and the leadership for psychological operations or hearts and minds, it's important to incorporate individuals from an indigenous population. Now, this is key. Because if, uh, uh, for example, a white non-Muslim individual was to go over to a vulnerable 16-year-old who was considered to be uh, vulnerable to radicalization, and I use that in quotations, the likelihood is that their arguments won't have a resonance. So what you do is you employ individuals who will be able to communicate because of cultural norms and values with an individual in order to persuade that individual. And this is ultimately what the channel program is interested in doing, especially the mentoring aspect of it, is to use individuals who will be able to communicate with a vulnerable individual in order to basically persuade them to not become future terrorists. <coughs> this is also <coughs> where uh, the activity falls under influence, and I'm going to focus on one, key leader engagement today. Key leader engagement is essentially about managing leaders in local communities, so it's a long um, it's a long process rather than um, waiting for an emergency or a crisis to arise and then going up to individuals within the community. So the whole point is to build up a relationship with a particular individual or an organization and then to draw and use that organization in order to ensure that your military and tactical objectives can be met when a particular crisis um, um, uh, arises. And this is, of course, where the Quilliam Foundation come into it, because the Quilliam Foundation have essentially been um, uh, issuing and disseminating a series of ideas which are extremely um, problematic, you could say. They are scientifically unproven, they are empirically untested, and I know I'm getting some grins from people, so I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Um, and they've been encouraging carte blanche surveillance of Muslim communities. Ed Hussein's infamous comments in 2009, which are there on the public record, um, can be consulted in order to show that point. And they've also been essentially responsible, according to one of the directors of that institution, the Quilliam Foundation, um, as having somewhat of attraction within policy circles. And re only recently, only a matter of weeks ago, uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, uh, name-dropped Quilliam Foundation as being an organization that he thought was quite useful in terms of helping aid his understanding about where the threat of political violence and political Islam comes from. What does the data show? Well, the data shows that this organization has clearly been manufactured, certainly at the onset, from government funds. And this data is accumulated under the Freedom of Information Act. It's available to everybody and anybody to have a look at. It's all available online. And it basically shows that almost two million pounds worth of funding for this 
claim to be nonpartisan organization involved in dealing with political violence and extremism, in quotes, has received two million pounds in government funding. Here is a breakdown for one of the years, uh, some number crunching that was done, and it basically shows that 93% of the funding in just one year, 2009 to 10, has come from the UK government. And it tells you how much has come from donations and how much has come from consultancy. So the evidence, they say, speaks louder than words, and I think that example and that pie graph, which is very colorful indeed, um, shows that quite strongly. Obviously, uh, across the pond in the US, the funding has also um, uh, been taking place. Uh, the Stuart Family Foundation um, has been responsible for issuing over half a million pounds to this organization. Anybody who knows anything about the Stuart Family Foundation will know that it is essentially an organization that encourages the use of counter-insurgency or counter-subversion, for those who are familiar with the Cold War, approach in dealing with uh, political Islamic opponents at home and indeed abroad. Also, the meetings with the government that have taken place, again acquired <coughs> under the Freedom of Information Act, shows a massive level of micromanagement. So some will argue, what happens? So what if an organization has been funded by the government? They can still operate independently and in a non-partisan way. Well, actually, no, that's not true. Because if we have a look at the amount of meetings that have paid, taken place with different agencies, and we have a look at what was discussed in those meetings, that paints another picture. And here is a record of what was discussed in those meetings. Uh, the yellow ones are, are the interesting ones. So the 30th of April, 2009, to discuss a Quilliam press release. Five more um, minutes. OK, thank you. Um, and if you roll down further, um, if you have a look, the yellow ones are all on the right, where it says record available. Incidentally, there's no record, so they can't be verified, actually, what was discussed in these meetings. So, you know, uh, in terms of accountability and transparency, it becomes very challenging to know what's happening with this organization and indeed the corridors of power. But, I mean, the yellow one's an informal catch-up between the director of Prevent and the Quilliam directors, who I'm presuming at that time were one Ed Hussein, now in the US, and Majid Nawaz. Here is another example. This document was made public many, many years ago, 2009. And it contains the words of one Debbie Gupta, the director of the Prevent Strategy in the Office for Security and Counterterrorism in the Home Office. And it says uh, after um, a report was produced on prisons by the Quilliam Foundation, um, uh, and, and Debbie Gupta writes this to the directors at Quilliam. I was disappointed at the way in which the publication of your report on <coughs> prisons was handled. OSCT were not given an opportunity to read the report in full prior to publication and indeed press coverage, I would reiterate my request that in future you share with us material you intend to release to the press in advance and in a timely fashion. What does this show in the last few minutes? It shows a few things. It shows how propaganda, which is the organized mechanisms through which persuasion takes place, has essentially been used and operationalized through one organization that I've picked on because I think it's of increasing significance in the UK counterterrorism discourse. There are others available that you can research if you wish. It shows how it's been used as a strategic resource. I also think how the manufacturing and the integration of um, militarized uh, practices into counterterrorism policy reveal the kind of uh, structure that this policy is operating within is one in which perceptions are that the opponent that we face can't be countered and dealt with or uh, tackled using usual law enforcement or policing mechanisms, but one which ultimately rel relies on a state of exception or the normalization of the state of exception, because a lot of these policies do normalize a state of exception. For example, you can be held for 14 days if you are suspected of being a terrorist. You can only be held for 96 hours if you are a criminal who has committed a non-terrorism offense. So there is one very superficial and one very brief example to show you this state of exception that exists. One more minute. Thank you. I think it's also very important to note that any policy that uses an approach that is based on a doctrine that is um, ultimately used for the control and domination of populations and territory which is where counterinsurgency comes from. It's from colonial times uh, used by the British Empire to control populations, is bound to be problematic. And the reason for that is, is that it creates or certainly gives this Manichaean view 
some kind of um, strength that they are against us, they are fighting us, <coughs> and we therefore are not only individuals involved in armed resistance, but we are holy warriors. So actually what you find is through the government's own strategy, which it thinks is so um, uh, appropriate in order to deal with this issue, not only does the issue become extremely uh, perpetuated, but it actually raises, uh, grieve, uh, it increases grievances, I beg your pardon, and it actually perpetuates the conflict. That leads to more insecurity, not less. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the actual objective of the counterterrorism strategy that we have, is it not to decrease insecurity rather than increase it? Thanks. Okay. Uh, Catherine Brown is next. Um, Catherine, who has only had to come from across town, uh, works at King's College. I do work at King's College, although not necessarily across town for my sins, hmm. uh, all the way out in Oxford. However, I'm also um, moving to Birmingham University in January to join their Religious Studies Department, which I'm really looking forward to. And you need your PowerPoint back up, don't you? Awesome. I don't have a PowerPoint, um, so we're okay there. I'm going to deviate slightly from the abstract that you've been given, uh, partly because I also want to talk about a few things that have uh, come up most recently in relation to questions that I've been frequently asked in relation to why it is that young British Muslim women would seek to jo join uh, so-called uh, Islamic State or Daesh, or just for shorthand here, Islamic State. And the problem as it is perceived, or the way in which the problem is framed to me is quite simple. Politicians and others have asked, why is it that young British Muslim women who have all the benefits and the wonders and the wisdoms of living in the United Kingdom would seek to give all of that up to go and join a restrictive, oppressive, barbaric organization and to go and live in a war zone? It is presented purely as a dichotomy of one place which has extreme good <coughs> values that are achievable and obtainable for all women, and in contrast to an organization and a place where none of those things are realizable. I would suggest to you that actually what that framing of the problem does is it places a simple understanding of what it is like to be a young British Muslim woman here in the United Kingdom, but also a simplistic understanding of what it is Daesh Islamic State are attempting to present to young British Muslim women. This problem also seems to ignore significant, sorry, the narrative as it is, ignores significant empirical evidence and also has a fundamental conflict at the heart of it. Because implied within this framing of the problem is that somehow the United Kingdom has achieved what no other country on the planet has done, which is pure gender equality, and that this is racially blind as well and that somehow this is achievable <coughs> for all women, including all Muslim women. But in doing this, our counter-radicalization programs nevertheless demand and insist that the solution is simply to empower Muslim women further, and that they need all of this some more, and that is indeed the problem. So you can see a tension and indeed a contradiction there, because on the one hand, they should already be empowered, and yet actually the problem is they are not empowered enough. And the solution is not necessarily to provide material or economic or social support, educational support, or indeed to look at some of the major issues surrounding what you might even desire in terms of emancipation or empowerment, but indeed simply to have leadership training programs which will last for one or two days. What is furthermore really interesting here is that when we start investigating further what exactly the counter-radicalization programs are that are being directed towards women, and at date there are actually very few of those. What they actually justify themselves as is not about recognizing that young British Muslim women may indeed be tempted to become radical. <coughs> no, the problem is they have failed to prevent their men from becoming radical. And most of this is directed at how to encourage and facilitate young Muslim women who are in fact then re-described as mothers and wives in spotting the signs of radicalization in their husbands, brothers, and sons. 
but not them themselves. They themselves are not agents. They do not get to have policy directed at them. Now, you could say that's an actually probably a really, really good thing, because when policy attention is focused upon young Muslims, it is very rarely to their benefit. Instead, actually what has happened is you see the continual reframing of young British Muslim women as passive, weak, vulnerable, brainwashed victims. That should they go and join Islamic State, it is because they are naive, sometimes stupid, or that they have somehow become obsessed with their own sexuality and fallen in love in some naive romantic vision and are going to go and marry a jihadi hottie because all they want to do is become a bride. Now, I'm doing a lobotomy, if you will, on much of the discussion. But what I'd also like to suggest to you that is actually, on the one hand here, we're saying that we are going to provide Muslim women and give them value and status here in the United Kingdom as mothers and wives, while at the same time turning around and complaining, in a way, that is what Islamic State also seek to do. Because I'd suggest to you, and this is quite controversial, that actually the young British Muslim women heading out there are not going out there to be jihadi brides. They're going out there to be jihadi wives. To be a bride implies that it is the one day that matters. It is not that. It is about the creation of a new good life, a new version of humanity, and a new version of their life in which they can unify their political objectives with their private faith in their everyday life and for it to have meaning and purpose. In a way, quite frankly, doing that here doesn't really hold much. Fun. The difficulty is, of course, that that is as much a lie from Islamic State and isn't anywhere near a representation of reality as one might argue the claim that the United Kingdom has somehow achieved gender equality for all as well. Neither of these are particularly true messages and neither of these actually hold out to represent perhaps uh, true freedom for young British Muslim women. But what I'd also like to suggest is that rather perhaps than focusing purely on ideas or suggesting that young British Muslim women need to do more in order to prevent their brothers, sons and husbands from being victims of radicalization, that actually we start taking seriously the concerns that young British Muslim women have. Now those concerns are concerns not just for their communities but actually for wider society. And this is where I get quite a lot of hate mail for suggesting this. I would suggest to, uh, to the audience here and to others that it is a tragedy of British society that young people believe that life is better in Islamic State and in Syria and Iraq than it is in the United Kingdom. And that is a tragedy that our citizens see life that way. That is a failing of our young people, of our politicians, of academics like myself and others, for not empowering young people, for not giving them control. Because I'd suggest it's not merely a lack of integration, perhaps, that is uh, a contribution to radicalization, but the failure to take our young people seriously in their politics and in their personal lives and to give them control. When you start reading through the narratives of young people who have traveled out to Islamic State, their increasing frustration at the lack of control, the lack of voice, the disempowerment that they face within their communities and within wider society. This is not some, simply something that we can, as uh, policy makers, simply throw back at the Muslim communities and say that they need to do better. I would suggest that all society needs to do better. I would also suggest that it would be incumbent upon us all to think more broadly in terms of what exactly does it mean to be a young British Muslim woman? What exactly does that mean in gendered terms? Because it is actually quite striking that although gender is rarely mentioned in any counter -narrat uh, narrative, in any sense of coined counterinsurgency, counterterrorism operations, when you look at the national security strategy, gender only comes up as a presumed liberal good i.e. gender equality, but it is never really discussed about what that might mean and how one can actually realise that in the terms that are meaningful to young people. I would also suggest that we really need to take seriously the claims Islamic State make about gender. They make particular claims about masculinity. They claim that European Muslim men are not real men at all. They claim that young British Muslim men are emasculated by the state that state behaviours 
remove their masculinity from them. And they use that actually to recruit young men as well and say, you come to us, you can be a real man, you can be a hero. <coughs> but five, more, five more minutes. There are clearly problems with that as well. Being a hero is not just simply about picking up a gun. In fact, actually, heroic restraint is something that various armed forces seek to uh, inculcate for various degrees of success, of course, but that's an issue there. But also looking at claims around <coughs> femininity and what does that mean, and the ideas of being a pure Muslim woman and how one can be feminine within a particular public and private space. And I think, actually, that is where we can engage with Islamic discourses of Islamic feminism as well, where we can look about what does it mean when we embrace a degree of complementarity or perhaps gender segregation? And what are the alternative traditions around gender within the Islamic faith and elsewhere that can be drawn upon in order so that we can challenge perhaps some of these very uh, diverging, sorry, um, divisive understandings of gender from Islamic State, rather than actually reimposing them through the current counter-narrative program. In relation to that, I would also suggest that giving young people the skills they need to create a counter-narrative is perhaps going to be way more influential than anybody like me doing it, or you, to be blunt. Actually, to my mind, what Islamic State have done is created a singular answer to the truth. They are totalitarian in their understanding of faith. They provide or they claim to provide the truth, <coughs> the one singular notion, and then actually a very anti-foundational manner that ignores centuries of Islamic thinking, and they recreate it in a postmodern world. They are also, as uh, Mohammed Alas argues, uh, a postmodern uh, organization. I would suggest that rather than trying to impose the correct version of Islam upon our young people, we should give them the skills give them the ability and empower them to determine what Islam means for them, to give them the ability to ask difficult questions of their community leaders, of imams, of theologians, of academics, politicians, policemen, but also to know how to question the answers that come back and not just be seduced by the glossy, shiny, or singing or dancing black and white world that Islamic State put forward. I would suggest that actually embracing the polarity and the diversity of Islam, rather than trying to impose and recreate a singular notion of it, is going to be the most <coughs> successful way of encouraging and empowering our young people so that they too can believe their future is better held here in the UK than in a war zone where life really is in Hobbesian terms, short, brutish, and nasty. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, and you were nice and short. Um, very good. Um, yeah, our final, uh, our final speaker is Wakas Tufail from Leeds Beckett University on the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015. Pretty topical subject. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I think I'm at a slight double disadvantage in that I'm the last speaker in the panel, so hopefully I'm not going to be too repetitive in what I'm saying, and also it's lunch next, so if your tummy is rumbling, please bear with me. Um, I think it's always the most unpopular slot when you're speaking at a seminar. Um, I've also had food poisoning in the past week, so I'm a little weak. Um, uh, I've eaten at some of the greasiest spoons in the country, and I've never had food poisoning, and I actually got food poisoning from a Sainsbury's salad. So I think that the moral of the story there is if you have a choice between salad and kebabs, stick to the kebabs. Um, so, okay. Go on, uh, no more excuses. Get on with it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So just bear with me is what I'm saying. Okay, um, so the Counterterrorism and Security Act, yes, this is a very topical issue. Um, and it's very prominent in terms of a lot of the discourse in newspapers and politics. Um, just to give some insight, um, first of all, it's been widely criticised. And it's been widely criticised by a number of Muslim political organisations, but also more broadly by human rights organisations, by by civil liberties groups, um, and kind of one of the, um, it covers a wide range um, of different measures um, in terms of the Counterterrorism and Security Act, but I'm going to focus on this mandatory push for public sector bodies to, uh, to have to engage with PREVENT. Um, so public sector bodies have engaged with PREVENT previously, um, but it's been on a voluntary basis. It's not been mandatory. That is the 
change that I'm going to focus on um, in this paper today. Um, and I think that it needs to be situated in the wider context of the failures that have been associated with Prevent. Um, and there's a wide range of literature on this, and I think that a good starting point is to look at the work of, of Aaron Kanani, and in particular um, his report Spooked, uh, that he did when he was at the Institute of Race Relations. Um, and he's also done some more recent stuff, but a range of scholars um, have really critiqued Prevent um, and in terms of the impact that has had on the Muslim community. Um, I want to focus on this idea of partnership policing, so now um, this kind of latest development where public sector bodies have to engage in partnership policing, so these are university lecturers, these are college lecturers, these are high school teachers, um, and I'm going to focus um, my insight on two projects which I'll briefly discuss. So the first one is my PhD study which was looking at partnership policing um, in marginalised deprived communities, and, and the second is an ongoing study that, uh, that I'm involved in, which is uh, looking at the lived experiences of British Muslim minorities in the context of integration demands. Um, so firstly, and very briefly, um, my PhD study was an ethnographic study um, of partnership policing. So after the 1998 Crime and Disorder Act, um, it was mandatory for a number of organisations to have to work with the police in partnership with the police to reduce a crime and disorder. Um, and this was kind of the focus of my research because there was hardly any literature mm -hmm. in terms of looking at what this meant for local communities on the ground. So I was lucky enough to have access to a police force, which is quite rare um, in research and criminology because the police are not always too willing to open their doors to researchers. And I completed more than 250 hours of observation over 18 months. Um, in terms of my findings, and it's always very difficult to summarise um, in such a short amount of time, but I found that the police heavily dominated the partnerships uh, that they were in, involved in, so these crime and disorder reduction partnerships or community safety partnerships, um, and that this actually sidelined the work um, of other agencies, for example, the local authorities or youth services or social services, um, and that this tended to result in punitive actions towards local residents. Um, and I found that this had a negative influence as well in terms of the work of partner agencies uh, who were then much more willing to share information with the police, um, not for a social welfare focus, but rather for a punitive, but, but rather for a punitive focus. And I also found um, in this context that policing, um, which I found was really interesting, was considered to be the primary social response to poverty because these marginalised communities that I was researching in um, these were given an additional level of policing, um, an intensive level of, of policing was the phrase that they used, the police at the time. Um, and I found that it was really interesting that policing was seen as the key social response to poverty, not any other kind of social welfare response. Um, another study that I'm currently involved in, and both of these studies shape what I'll be talking about today, um, is to explore this concept of integration and what it and what it means for, sec for second generation British Muslims. Um, so these interviews were carried out um, and they are still going on as well uh, with British Muslim men and women, primarily in the Greater Manchester area. And some of the themes from interviewees included identity, belonging and criminalization. Um, so the CTSA Act, um, as I've already mentioned, it makes it mandatory for non-police organizations to effectively take on policing responsibilities. It affects um, a number of public sector bodies, universities, colleges, schools, local, local authorities, the, the NHS and prisons, and they require staff to monitor for such issues such as signs of radicalisation. And now this has been heavily critiqued in the literature um, in terms of some of the sociology literature, criminology literature, um, uh, in terms of how ambiguous these signs of radicalisations are. Um, and also one of the worrying developments is that prosecution is a possibility of non-compliance uh, with this new mandated responsibility. Um, and another development that coincides with this um, is that it places Channel on a statutory footing. Um, how many people have heard of Channel? Uh, so this is a multi-agency de-radicalization program. That sounds awful, doesn't it, de-radicalization? I have this image of some kind of decompression chamber that they put so-called radical Muslims into, and they press a the button and they come out de-radicalized. You know, um, I'm not sure if it's Majid Nawaz pressing the button or something, but um, I mean, um, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, so what this does in terms of 
now looking at some of the, impl some of the implications of the Counterterrorism and Security Act, emerges counterterrorism policing and criminal justice with social policy. Okay, and I think that this, again, is a really worrying development, okay? Um, and there's huge concern from academics, from lecturers, from teachers, in that this will lead to the policing of ideas. And we've already heard mentioned this morning the Muslim student who mentioned the phrase eco-terrorism, and that this aroused the suspicion uh, of teachers, um, and also relies on ambiguous concepts such as British values. And this is at the heart of the discourse in terms of looking at counter-terrorism. And I think that one of the key things that we need to focus on, really, in terms of making sense of this, is how concepts um, around social policies, such as cohesion and integration, are then fused with counter-terrorism and policing. I think that is a key development, okay, that we need to concentrate on. Um, so British values, um, you know, again, uh, I think that this has been heavily criticised today in, t in terms of some of the concepts of British values. What are British values? Selling arms to Saudi Arabia, a, a brutal dictatorship, um, inviting Sisi, um, a, dicta a dictator from Egypt, you know, are these British values? You know, um, you know that's just a, a starting point. It's a nonsense when we, when we talk about British values. Five more minutes. It doesn't really mean Five anything. Five more? Yep. Yep. Five. Five. Minutes. Cheers, yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. Um, so, and again, some of the other suspicions or some of the other um, worrying aspects that, that have been raised by commentators are, are around the fact that within a climate of anti-Muslim hostility and rhetoric, and I think that it's beyond doubt that we're in that particular climate, um, that there's the potential for local actors to rely on, on biases, prejudice, and misconceptions. We have to, we have to contextualise this development, okay? It's important to think of context. We live in a context of growing Islamophobia. We live in a context of growing suspicion of Muslims, and we need to think about the context. Um, and from all of the literature that we have, or from the majority of the literature that we have, we know that this is going to be discriminatory towards Muslims. Um, I've, already, I've already mentioned the Challenge Program. I think that this is a brilliant quote from, from some, some academics at Edge Hill University. Um, that kind of challenge some of the underpinning features of the channel program, which relies on a multi-agency initiative involving psychologists and psychotherapists and youth workers trying to de-radicalize um, uh, those that are considered to be extremists or radical. And they say that as criminally formulated and practiced, counter-terrorism and counter-radicalization strategies aimed at safeguarding vulnerable children and young people from extremism are ill-conceived, unreliable, and give legitimacy to unjustifiable regulation and social control of young British Muslims, underpinned by essentialised and racialised constructions of childhood vulnerability and bolstered by pseudo-scientific psychology or radicalisation discourse, education and welfare agencies are now strategically positioned at the forefront of the late war on terror. Um, I think that this lack of democracy, just coming back to British values, I think that this lack of democracy and lack of accountability is central to the development of the Counterterrorism and Security Act and to, and to channel um, as well. And just one thing that I'd like you to reflect on is what actually happens to that Muslim student that is referred to the, to the channel or prevent officer? It might not mean that they are faced with a criminal offence or um, because um, to take part in channel, they say that it needs to be on a voluntary basis. But what happens to that Muslim student in terms of their sense of belonging, in terms of their sense of themselves. And I think that we need to, I think that we need to have t some kind of, re of reflection um, on this Borgiosian sense um, of symbolic violence. Okay, what violence is being caused here that we, that we can't actually measure? Um, and I think it's fair to say that, I mean, and this is open, David Cameron, you know, he, um, he gave this speech in Birmingham. He chose Birmingham for a reason, right? There's a lot of Muslims there. In June or July, when he gave his speech, outlining his new counter-extremism strategy. You know, this is going to be targeted against Muslims. Muslims have to feel the pain of the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act. So we have to regard this as fundamentally racist because it's targeting a particular group. One more minute. Okay, great. Um, I just want to end now uh, with some final quotes that I'll just let you read, actually, because um, I need a drink. I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, but, um, uh, this, but these are just some views from our, from our respondents in our research in terms of looking at this concept of integration and what, and what it meant for them, because from a lot of our respondents, um, they felt fully integrated. You know, um, they had normal jobs, they had, they had normal relationships, they had a normal involvement in local community life, in local political life. Their friends had a wide variety of diverse friends, but actually, their sense of belonging was disrupted by others. And I think that we need to turn this concept of integration on its head and then look at how the wider community and how wider, <laughs> and how wider society um, constructs Muslims, okay? So what space is made for them to integrate, um, even though this 
concept of integration are highly challenged anyway. So these are just a couple of um, quotes here that I won't have time to uh, fully go through. Um, I'm more than happy to share the presentation afterwards. And I think I'm running out of time now, but um, I'll be very, very quick just to summarise. Um, there is a campaign of resistance um, against the Counterterrorism and Security Act and against this new wave of prevent. And I think it's important for people to get involved. Um, I think it's important for people to recognise that with policy phases like this, it's only resisted by grassroots campaigning. Uh, so please get involved. Um, and finally, I think, and this is the point that I want to focus on, the Counterterrorism and Security Act is going to rupture the social bonds that, that Muslims have with their peers and their institutions. Um, Muslim students are already more likely to face structural inequalities, um, to be discriminated against in the job market, facing Islamophobia, and now this new wave of prevent is just one more thing that they have to face. And I think it's important That's more than a minute. that we reflect on it. Okay, thank All you right. very much. Thank you. Great, all right. Um, well, thanks to all our speakers. Um, uh, we've got about 12 minutes to, um, to have a <coughs> conversation about what you just heard. Um, I have been allowed to abuse my position as chair to uh, ask a couple of questions myself, which I'm very happy to do. Um, it may not surprise you that I, I um, would like to ask uh, a, a question to Rizwan. Um, I mean, I wonder, you know, you would no doubt accept that a government's primary responsibility is the security of its citizens. Uh, Islamic extremism is clearly a threat to that security. I, uh, I, I'm rather puzzled by your surprise and, uh, and apparent shock at the fact that the government is prepared to fund an organization um, which opposes Islamic extremism. Um, the state supports SOAS, the state supports you, uh, the state spends a great deal more than two million pounds uh, funding no, uh, cr 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 critical academics. Um, I work for the public uh, sector. Yeah, you work for the public state. sector. Um, um, uh, two million pounds seems, <laughs> seems to me money pretty well spent. And also it seemed to stop after uh, 2012. Quilliam very nearly went bankrupt. Um, and I mean, you know, is it not better to have an organisation like Quilliam? Okay, it has many critics. Uh, it's trying to produce a, a kind of a, a, a more liberal version of British Islam. Um, is, it, is, it not better, is it not better to have Quilliam rather than local police forces uh, intervening and influencing prevent. Uh, I would have thought it would be. Um, Thank you, David. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, uh, as regards Catherine, um, the one thing I would say to Catherine is I happen to know somebody uh, called Sharia Khatoon who runs a Mothers Against Radicalization organization. She's neither naive, weak, nor passive. She's indeed the Labour deputy leader of Tower Hamlets Council. Um, my, my final, more general point is that we've had a lot of hyperbolic language up here about the illiberalism of all this legislation. But interestingly enough, what we don't have is a long list of egregious miscarriages of justice. Now, no doubt there have been one or two, but I think what actually is happening here... Yeah, yeah, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, I'm just about to finish. What, what I think is interesting here is that so much of this legislation, and my God, we have had a lot of it, is essentially a signal setting operations, is signalling, trying to signal reassurance to the British population, uh, including the mu Muslim part of it. I mean, unsuccessfully possibly, in that it has alienated um, certainly qu quite large parts of the Muslim intelligentsia. Um, and I think what's interesting is that, as I say, we do have, I mean, it has not been, it has not created lots of martyrs. Yeah, I know, Sorry, I know. I okay. All right. So, well, I know. Well, I, 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 I was invited to put some questions. All right. You, okay, you guys can come back in a minute. I'm going to ask for some questions from the floor first. Can we, can we um, just get some responses from the two people who were addressed by your comments? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, in fact, that's precisely my point. Young Muslim women are not passive weak or anything but in fact when you start looking at the evidence and the kinds of uh, when we start looking at Muslim women's activism it is very much based within their faith and within 
also their commitment to what you call thick social bonds. My point is that when you look at the legislation, the <coughs> policy, and the way in which they're framed, is that it reinforces a particular narrative that does not add up to uh, reality. Secondly, I would suggest that if this is a signalling manoeuvre, it comes with very few checks and balances. And I personally believe that a, a British value is to be somewhat sceptical of government. Yep, fine. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, that question, um, oh, I mean, I don't even where to begin with it. The threat, let's just take the threat as the first issue, right? I'm sure you value and respect Europol, which is a very reputable European-wide policing agency involved in serious organized crime and terrorism. According to their figures, um, from 2006 to 13, only 0.7% of the threat of political violence from political Islamic groups has come from Muslims. Is that because um, the threat of that is gone now? No, that's, uh, no, secular, <laughs> secular, no, secular and well, not steps, people of no religion. The threat from ETA gone. It's just important. Well, well, I, 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 it, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter I, whether the threat from ETA has gone, Rashad, no, because all the, well, hold on, let me just finish. Facts. It doesn't I know matter. It's upsetting when facts get in no, the way. No, 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 facts are not getting in the way. No, facts no, are supporting the point. Answer him in a sec, answer him in a sec. Rashad, <laughs> facts are supporting the point that the threat is, is about representation as opposed to actual mm. hard evidence. And even if you look at the number of people that have been convicted for terrorism, you quickly find that most of the people that are being prosecuted are being oh. prosecuted because of uh, possessing information, which is a criminal offence to be in possession of information, irrespective of what you intended to do with that information. And this is a key point. Mm. So the Europol figures are not just one abstract figure that I'm throwing out. It's actually yeah. supported by others. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you can come the back. The second thing's about the Quilliam Foundation. Is it appropriate for the government to fund Quilliam Foundation? There is nothing wrong with the government aiming to basically deal with issues of insecurity. That's their job, as you rightly note, and that's a very heartfelt idea that liberals always talk about. But what I do have a problem with is the government trying to legitimize its policy by manufacturing elements within civil society. Because the whole point that turns out here, then, is that civil society becomes an arena and a domain in which the, those in power basically legitimize their policy and their rule, rather than civil society, what Rashad was talking about, that we need to stop legislating and use civil society. Yes, let's use civil society, but let's not make civil society into, the, into basically uh, an extension of the state. And Quilliam's fun manufacturing and funding is essentially <coughs> that way of legitimizing Russia, government do, policy. Do you, do you want to come back on the figures? <laughs> Okay. And if you could raise your hands while Rashad is speaking so we can get a mic over to you if you've got a question. Just yeah, Rashad, you go. Just briefly, I think it's important with, with a lot of this discourse that actually to step back and look at it. So with Europol, it's not that the stats are wrong, they're actually completely sound. But there's a reason why there's a disproportionate amount because actually we've had whole swathes of terrorist groups, etc., involved in terrorist acts. A large number of them have actually stopped. So, like ETA now, completely outside of that statistical data now. But then so hence, no, but that hence, doesn't that doesn't know. That's irrelevant. Right, okay, and they're not completely I, 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 I'm either. Speaking, no, no, I'm speaking. Okay, go on. So now, yeah. hence, what actually happens is that if you have a group which has perpetrated 75% of terrorist acts that are collected in that data no longer functioning, they're, they're out of that statistical realm now. Where's the mic? It's misrepresenting a finding from a stat. I'm sure all you guys who do research methodology look into things like that. But the, the stats the show, video. Rashad, that the, the most right, the okay. political violent okay. threat comes from right wing and secular mm. movements. Mm. And so the, in now, fact, the figures aren't completely sound so because Britain doesn't provide data okay, okay. on can, can we have, Irish violence. Can, can we have a, a question from the floor? Um, come on, quickly. No. Just shout, just shout, Mohamed. Mohammed Amin, patron of Curriculum for Cohesion. My question is for Catherine Brown. Mm -hmm. You were very eloquent at describing the imperfections of British society, and I also agree that British society is imperfect. You described Islamic State as imperfect. Are you finding any kind of equivalence in their imperfections? Okay, well, well, well let's just take a couple more. Let's take a couple more. The, the guy behind you? Anybody else? Hi, um, my name is Imtiaz. I have a question for Catherine as well, unfortunately. Um, um, I often see conversations like what the Rizwan said about uh, people being funded by large groups like governments um, to affect civil society. Um, and yet groups, and you were talking about how we need to give young Muslim women uh, more of a voice uh, from themselves, and I agree completely. How do you do that when groups like AIRA 
earn a million a year, a million a year, and there, there's groups like Al-Madin Institute funding all these organizations. It goes far as far back as the 70s with Sheikh Zindani. How do you do that when the conversation is completely owned by a few groups that tend to get their funding from Zakat or from, from other um, external agencies uh, <coughs> outside of the UK? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. let's, let's take a couple more. Lady up there. Um, sorry, my question is also for Catherine, which is, um, <laughs> thank you, that oh, was a really, really keep notes in it was a really fantastic need. presentation. You might distribute your questions amongst others. <laughs> the thing I was wondering about was how feasible is it for young Muslim women to have these difficult conversations and debates with each other given the current climate and especially the criminalisation of socially uh, conservative Islamic views and I'm thinking in particular about as a, as a teacher in a classroom, how comfortable do they feel discussing these issues? I would say not very. Um, anyone else? And then I'll come back to the panel for no one. Some of those people who were clapping so enthusiastically. Your clappers rather than speakers. Ah, one guy here. Uh, Abdullah Al-Samatan, Grand Mufti of Exeter. Um, <laughs> My question is about, so a lot has been said about the Quilliam Foundation, and I agree with Dr. Rizwan about their role in, uh, in, in creating a lot of that discourse, but not much has been said about the demonizing of organizations that are very vocal and active about countering this sort of government policy um, regarding extremism. Can the panel open up a little bit more on this topic as well? Because I think that this was something that was a little bit neglected just throughout the, most of the so, sir, presentations. Sir, I, did, I didn't understand what you meant. So on one hand, you've got a number of organizations that the government um, kind of supports and <coughs> listens to when it comes to formulating policy. On the other hand, you've got a number of organizations that are actively demonized within the public discourse and within, within government um, policy as well. Could you give Can an example? Cage. Okay. We'll so that, that's the obvious one, right? Um, so can, uh, I'm, I'm starting to think of other ones, but I'm sure there are other ones. Can the panel talk a little bit more about that as well? Because that, I mean, coming from a background of, of kind of grassroots activism, it is a little bit difficult to engage with different organizations when the climate is so fierce. Okay, um, how about one minute for everybody? Yeah. Um, you, uh, um, she should get more than one minute. Well, <laughs> well, she, she has already spoken once. You haven't spoken at all. In the, um, why don't you, um, or perhaps you should wind up actually. You can wind up so you can respond to everything. Uh, shall we start this end? Yeah, I mean, um, well, I think it's important to consider this, cons um, this kind of idea of who the government counts as a valid British Muslim voice. So I think it was on the day or the day after the Counterterrorism and Security Act kind of uh, passed through Parliament um, and it was finalised and the government had this community engagement forum um, and there's been a lack of transparency over who was invited to that forum and on what basis they were invited. And it just seemed like it was a number of conservative Muslim organisations um, or, or Muslim organisations who have conservative political views um, that are more or less in line with the government. And I think that there needs to be much more transparency from government as to, as to why they prefer working with certain organisations over another. And my view is that this is about politics. The Quilliam Foundation share the politics of the government in terms of how they understand and interpret counter-terrorism and, and counter-extremism. And that's what there's other organizations that are demonized. The Muslim Council of Britain, who are the largest Muslim organization in, in, in the UK, the government won't even talk to them today. You know, so I think that that shows the state of affairs in terms of, um, you know, um, in terms of how the government views the Muslim community and about who they regard as valid spokespersons for the Muslim community. Power doesn't like a check. And CAGE stands up for those who are uh, unlawfully uh, held, tortured, mistreated, so on and so forth. That brings those who occupy the corridors of power, in particular the executive and the intelligence services, into disrepute. So what you therefore find is that a narrative is created in which those who seek to, even though some of their views might be challenged or, or questionable, what you find is that even their good work becomes tarred with this negative brush that they are terrorist apologists and so on and so forth. So you won't probably hear very often that when Alan Henning, the taxi driver from Salford, was uh, held hostage before being executed brutally by ISIS, that those in cage from their prison cells, I'm talking in particular Mozambique, tried to work through his lawyer, Gareth Pierce, 
with the Foreign Office in order to secure his release, and how those uh, uh, calls and requests were basically had fallen on deaf ears. So when you find this logic that we're not engaging with Cage, partially it's based on this logic that uh, talking to them will legitimize them, and therefore um, you can't do that because you disagree with them on a few uh, issues or policy areas or whatever. But the second one is if you legitimize this organization, which has kind of become at the cutting edge of activism in the war on terror, then you will basically empower them. And that is a, a, a challenge for your power and, and what, what your policy seeks to do. Great. So it's better to just sideline them and agree <coughs> with the echo chambers, thank you, David, that agree with you in order to Great. push forward your own narratives. Catherine. Okay, so there are a number of points. First one is there equivalency between Islamic State and the United Kingdom. I'd suggest not on a number of grounds, and I am by no means an apologist for the violence that Islamic State carry out. What I would say, however, and I think it's something we need to guard against, Islamic State, by presenting a totalitarian vision of Islam, by saying they hold a particular narrative that is the only legitimate narrative, presents this idea that there can only ever be one singular way of being. And I'd suggest that we also need to resist that, kind of just reversing that by saying we have the one singular way of being, because all you do is repeat the logic and grammar of uh, totalitarian thinking. And I actually think Islam resists that and has done for many tr uh, centuries. And therefore, if we want to look at practical steps, and I think teachers' jobs have been made incredibly harder, so too university lecturers, to be able to discuss freely many of the issues that do concern our young students and uh, school pupils, partly because of the requirement placed upon us to uh, monitor and to, uh, as a duty of care, young individuals uh, in case they are at risk of <coughs> radicalization. But what is interesting to my mind is that what we, uh, I would suggest in practical senses, do is give our young people the critical thinking skills. Um, and I know that's very academic of me to give an academic solution to a, a socio-political and a theological problem, perhaps. But actually, if we give people those skills through education, through social workers, through youth groups, through charitable organisations, through the mosques, and give them the skills that they need to recognise when a glossy magazine is actually just a glossy magazine, when actually listening only to one source of information can be damaging. Because also one of the things that's really transparent to me is that over time, young people, when they become um, involved with various radical groups, stop listening to alternative sources of information. They stop believing alternative sources of information. They isolate themselves from their community, from their families, from their friends. They take on this one singular narrative. And again, it is the diversity of voices, a polarity of voices to, that will be more effective than trying to present one singular counter-narrative. Thanks. I think that's really key, actually, this whole, the, the, the mentality that says that we have a singular source for reality. And as a result of that singular source for reality, we have a singular source for religion, etc., and politics, and everything comes down to that. Um, coming to some of the, the, the questions really quickly, a few things. Um, with regards to CAGE as an example, CAGE is a really good example because you have here um, an organization which is doing something really, really vital, which is holding the state to account, which is what we all should be doing. However, the values and the ideology of the organization is one that's antithetical to state, not as in governance, but to the very essence of everything surrounding that state. So therefore, if you have as an example an organization which went and interviewed Anwar Aulaki well after he'd already declared total jihad against the West on his blog site for several years. An organization that a few weeks ago had Abu Qatada speaking at their, you know, speaking on uh, uh, their events. Abu Qatada has recently recycled, you know, very clear Al-Qaeda literature, which he denied doing explicitly, but said he agreed with all the views in the Al-Qaeda magazine, just to, to be pedantically accurate. And as an organization which, yes, deals with some of the injustices, but also <coughs> deals with defending people who are convicted of terrorism because, very clearly, they explain this on their website, that they are looking at this in the world of jihad. And that the people who are convicted of terrorism are prisoners of jihad. This on their website, on the Cage Prisoners website. So we shouldn't blindfold ourselves about this stuff. It's really explicit, and they're open about it. Or prisoners they of don't. conscience, Rashad. Or no, prisoners no, no, they, that were no, no, imprisoned as part say. of the Black that's Panther they, No, no, the language they you use is... The, no, 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 as a fact, the language they use is these are prisoners... That's just their language. 
It's just a word used no, to describe a reality. A yes, it is. No, 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 That's all no, language is. It's no, a method no, of communication. You can argue about this over lunch. This, this, is, why it's utter, this is why it's utter nonsense. No, it's to, not to take away it's meaning from people that very explicitly define it. They have a whole section explaining what they're talking about, why these people are Mujahideen, why they're Asirain al-Jihad, why there's a religious duty right, as part of the fiqh of jihad um, to release yeah. them. But you okay, right, okay. take away you struggle. their yeah. own explanation. We, we're going okay, can to we, can we Can we move on? Go. Um, this is nonsense. We, 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 we want to move on. Fine, our final speaker, uh, Mohamed Aziz. Um, can I just what well, one thing that you said that, that surprised me was you said that the legislation had driven um, you know, extremist views underground, and you gave us your evidence for that, rather egocentrically, if you don't mind me saying, the fact that you were surprised by 7-7. I mean, do you have any other evidence for this, this driving underground? I mean, Hizbut Tahrir is still legal, as far as I understand, isn't it? I mean... Okay, well, I think I said a little bit more than that, um, but the main point... Your mic, your mic, Mohammed. Turn the mic on, no, bring it yeah. closer to you, bring it closer to you. Um, the main point for me is that we've now had 15 years of legislation and non-legal measures um, since 2000, um, and all that we've done, I feel, just hasn't worked. And whether it's legislation, whether it's legislation or non-legal measures, <coughs> and as somebody who's you know, very involved in the community, has been involved in the Muslim community since my early teens. Um, going back even 10 years, I would not have imagined that we would have get young girls from Tower Hamlets going to Syria to be you know, jihadi wives or however you want to phrase it. Um, and yes, I was surprised that up until 7-7, I would say, well, actually, we've never had terrorist attacks on our soil. And in a sense, I wasn't expecting it the way it happened on 7-7. So I was very, very surprised. Um, and all the stuff that's happened since then, and I know so much going on in the Muslim community now, and one of the examples that I gave was that in the 90s, when you know, there was stuff going on, and even before that, in Afghanistan and Chechnya and Bosnia, you heard calls for, you know, jihad, whether it's recruitment or financial assistance. I remember very, very clearly when I was um, at a, a Friday prayer in Kings once that there was an open <coughs> call to join the jihad in Chechnya. You would not hear that kind of thing now, and you just don't know what's going on. That's what I meant by a lot of that stuff that was going on in the Muslim community in the 90s has gone underground, so we don't know what's happening. Now, there may be some good in this, some bad in this. Uh, I just want to expand this point and to say that because things are not working, the measures that we're putting in place are not working, the measures that we're getting are becoming more and more draconian. Um, and you just look at the pattern of the legislation starting from 2000 to 2015. And at every stage, it's becoming more and more draconian. And actually, it's not working. Um, I think we need to do at least three things to make things work, to turn the table. I think the first thing that we have to do is we have to move away from this almost ideological, dogmatic position that the cause of terrorism is singly and solely bad theology. Um, and I think we have to look at the literature, the research that says it's a complex number of reasons. Um, but, you know, I was in government when Tony Blair, Prime Minister at the time, gave that speech. And it was as if this was the only cause. And if we could solve bad theology in Muslim communities, we could solve the problem. You know, I think we've got to move away from that. We haven't. <coughs> and it's still the driving force behind so much legislation and so many government measures at the moment. The second thing that we have to do, and that's been raised, and I'm not just going to touch on it, is that we have to engage with a wider spectrum of the Muslim community, not just the people that sound like what government people are saying um, and what, what we used to call in government the white noise is saying. We have to involve a much, much wider, richer spectrum of all communities, but in this case, all sectors of the Muslim community. And the third thing that I would say is that we have to return the authorship and the ownership of Islamic vocabulary and Islamic 
uh, concepts to the mainstream Muslim community. It's almost like the Home Secretary can say what is a perversion of Islam and what is right Islam and what is moderate Islam, not the Muslim community anymore. And I think until we return the authorship and ownership of what is mainstream Islam to the Muslim community, we will have young people turning away from what are otherwise good messages. Thanks very much indeed. Thank, thank you. I want to I thank David for chairing the session and I also want to thank all of our panellists.